Breaking news. The B.C. finance minister is delivering the last budget before the provincial election in the fall. Let's go there live. Everyone wants a decent home in the community they love. And we all need access to quality health care, including a family doctor. Budget 2024 delivers on these priorities while continuing to build an economy that works better for everyone. There's a lot of work ahead of us, but we are starting from a place of strength. BC is a great place to live, where people can put down roots and raise a family. We've got good opportunities today and the resources we need to succeed in the future. And wherever you call home, there is incredible natural beauty at our doorstep. For me, the Kootenays are home. It's where I've worked. As the first woman at the local pulp mill, as an instructor for early childhood education at Selkirk College, as an executive director of a nonprofit, and as where I breed cattle on my farm. The Kootenays are where we chose to raise our family, and it's a place where I proudly live today as a Minister of Finance. And while I can't say I'm the very first finance minister from rural BC, I can say it's been a while. Our government has shown that we can put people first and build a strong economy. Some said this wasn't possible. They argued that increasing the minimum wage would hurt job numbers. BC now has the highest minimum wage of any province and some of the strongest self-employment growth in Canada. They said we couldn't afford to build a universal childcare system from the ground up. In fact, affordable and accessible childcare has contributed to more than 100,000 women joining the workforce since 2017. Yeah. They said we couldn't fight climate change while growing BC's natural resource sector. And yet, emissions are down and projects like the Cedar LNG facility are moving forward. It's going to be the largest First Nations majority-owned energy project in the country and one of the cleanest liquefied natural gas facilities in the world. <clears throat> These are just a few examples, Mr. Speaker, of the action our government is taking to make life better for people right around the province. Now, I do want to recognize the times we find ourselves in. BC is an economic leader in Canada, but too many people are still struggling to get ahead. Global inflation and high interest rates have made everything from housing to groceries more costly. And with a slower global economy, we are feeling the effects here in British Columbia. At the end of the day, people have a lot on their minds right now, and they're feeling stretched. My family is no exception. We often get together for small family dinners, and by small I mean about 35 of us, and as a granny to nine grandchildren and many more grandnieces and nephews, I hear from their parents how access to affordable childcare was life-changing. From my own experiences and that of other relatives, I see how important it is to have access to a family doctor and health care close to home. And while housing has been out of reach for so long for many people, I'm starting to hear stories that give me hope. This one chokes me up. <laughs> With more homes being built and short-term rentals coming up for sale in her Kelowna neighbourhood, my granddaughter sees a future where she could own her own first home. It won't be tomorrow, and it'll take a lot of hard work, but she said to me, I think it's possible, Granny. These are the conversations so many families are having at kitchen tables right across the province. And as Finance Minister, I want you to know that when times are tough, our government works for you. We have your back. And we will continue taking action for you so more, pe <coughs> excuse me, so more people feel hopeful about their future here. Some look at the challenges ahead and say government should respond with deep cuts, leaving people to fend for themselves. This would only weaken the services we all rely on and drive up costs with added fees and fares. It would leave people at risk to those who take unfair advantage by putting profits ahead of people. We see this in the current housing crisis. After decades where the housing market served the interests of investors and speculators, even those who earn a decent income are finding it hard to afford a home. And that doesn't sit well with our government. To further crack down on speculators, Budget 2024 will bring in the new BC Home Flipping Tax. To those who just want to make a quick buck by flipping homes, things are about to get more difficult. If a home is sold within two years of purchase, the profit will be taxed and the revenue will go right back into building middle-class homes for people. Mm. 
We all understand that life can change quickly, so there will be exceptions. But our government will always go after bad actors, whether they're dealing in real estate, money laundering, organized crime, and more. And we'll continue to stand with working people through higher wages, better protections on the job, and by ending MSP premiums to deliver the largest middle class tax cut in a generation. Budget 2024 continues to put people first and keeps building on a strong foundation. We are taking action to fix today's big challenges and secure a brighter future for everyone. We'll do this by helping people with everyday costs, delivering more homes around BC, strengthening health care and the services people rely on with steady investments, and by building a stronger, cleaner economy that works better for people. Whether I'm at home in Pass Creek or at work in Victoria, I hear from those who are worried about everyday costs going up. While inflation has made things worse, people have been feeling stretched for a while. That's why our government has been helping with costs for years. We took tolls off bridges, made transit free for children under 12, and ICBC car insurance rates have been frozen or been cut on average by $500 a year for drivers. We became the first province in Canada to make prescription contra contraception free, saving a person up to $300 a year on birth control pills or up to $10,000 over a lifetime. We cut child fees by up to an average of $900 per month. And Mr. Speaker, we made a historic investment in school meal programs and contributed $60 million to the Student and Family Affordability Fund. This helps school districts cover extra costs like school supplies, field trips, or band instruments and school sports. I recently visited a school in Surrey and heard from a principal what a difference this has made for her students, not just at home, but at home as well. As a principal, she said she hopes students and families can continue to count on this, to, on this support. And today, I'm happy to say, yes, they can. <laughs> we will be replenishing the Student and Family Affordability Fund with more details to come soon. Our government has long been focused on reducing costs for education so people can get the training they need to land a better paying job. I think of Tara, who completed a bachelor's degree with plans for a master's program. As a former youth in care, she was able to do this for free in British Columbia. Tara will be the first in her family to graduate from university and as she describes it, the one to break a generational cycle. A little extra money can make life easier and it can bring your dreams a little closer. We know there's more to do. In an expensive world, Budget 2024 takes targeted action to keep more money in your pocket. A new BC Electricity Affordability Credit will save seniors, families, and individuals an average of $100 on their household bills over the next year. And the average small businesses will save around $400 over the year. The credits will appear on bills from, March to next April, from April to next March. Mr. Speaker, Many families will already be familiar with the BC Family Benefit. And now, starting in July, more parents will receive more money as we launch bonus payments for one year. The BC Family Benefit bonus will add 25% to the benefit and go to about 340,000 families. With the year-long bonus, a family of four will receive as much as $3,563, and a single parent with one child will receive up to $2,688. This works out to an average of $445 extra dollars per year. Parents can use the money to help with anything from groceries to regi registering their kids for the sports teams that they've always wanted to go to. With these targeted measures, Budget 2024 will help keep your bills down and more money in your pocket at the end of each month. Mr. Speaker, for so many of us, housing costs are the greatest expense we face, whether it's rent or mortgage payments. The housing crisis is complex. It's been made worse by decades of inaction, where governments of all levels left it to the private market to deliver homes. Prices went up as governments stepped back and speculators moved in. That's why we're bringing in the home flipping tax as our latest measure to crack down on bad actors. The problems facing our housing market have deep roots. Our government is responding with big solutions that will deliver more homes for people. We're starting to see progress. Nearly 78,000 homes are complete or underway. 
There's been a 30% increase in new rental homes registered, a leading indicator of housing activity. And we're turning short-term rentals into long-term homes, changing outdated zoning and building housing near transit so people save money and enjoy more time with their families. This is all promising, but our team is nowhere near satisfied. Budget 2024 will build more housing and help first-time home buyers break into the market. Because even with a good job and, ste and steady saving, it's tough to put together a down payment these days. As a result, there's more pressure on the housing market with people renting for longer. But as most people will tell you, every little bit helps. The first time home buyer, home, the first time home buyer program was designed to provide that financial boost. But the program no longer reflects the realities of today's housing market. That changes with Budget 2024. First-time home buyers will save up to $8,000 thanks to a reduced bill for property transfer tax. We expect up to 14,500 people, twice as many as before, will now be eligible for support to buy their first home. Additionally, people will pay a reduced amount of property transfer tax when they build, buy a newly built home. There's more to do, but these targeted, practical changes will help more middle-income people move up the home ownership ladder. Mr. Speaker, just over a week ago, our government launched BC Builds. BC Builds will leverage government-owned, government public, and underused land and low-cost financing to bring down construction costs and deliver more middle-class housing. Think of homes built on top of community hubs like recreation centres and libraries. Think about transforming an empty parking lot into homes for middle-class families. BC Builds will turn these ideas into action. One of the best features is that these homes will be income tested when a person moves in. Most residents will be spending no more than 30% of their income on rent. This will be a welcome relief for many, but I know there are renters who need support today. Our government has capped rent increases below the rate of inflation and boosted the BC Rent Bank. This is also the first year that people can receive up to $400 through a renter's tax credit. Budget 2024 will also introduce a property transfer tax exemption for new purpose-built rental buildings. This is a temporary measure that will help get more rental homes built in communities across BC. Strong public services, including health care, have always been foundational to our province. And today, Mr. Speaker, people are coming to BC in record numbers. They bring their skills as doctors, nurses, teachers, and as people working to build homes, hospitals, and schools. In return, we need to make sure everyone has access to the services that we all count on. For many people, quality health care is top of mind, and with good reason. There are new pressures on our health care system, including a worldwide labour shortage, a retiring health workforce, and a growing population. We're taking steps to confront these challenges and strengthen health care in BC. By adding 700 family doctors and over 6,000 nurses, while allowing pharmacists to prescribe for minor illnesses. By making international credential recognition faster. And by developing a new medical school at SFU, the first to be built in Western Canada in more than 50 years. <laughs> to build on this foundation, Budget 2024 will provide an additional $6, $6 billion over the fiscal plan to strengthen health care. We are expanding home and community care services for more seniors, so they can live healthy, independent lives in their homes. New or upgraded long-term care homes are on the way for communities around BC, including Abbotsford, Nanaimo, Cranbrook, and Prince George. We're also continuing to build a better, more connected system of mental health and addictions care, where people get the right support at the right time, whether it's with a newly dedicated team at St. Paul's Hospital or at the Red Fish Healing Center. These are the kind of supports that made all the difference for Tyson, now a peer educator at the New Roads Recovery Community in Victoria. In just six months, he has gone from being in jail to getting care and becoming an advocate for people with mental health and addictions. Now Tyson is helping others on their journey. 
Cancer has touched the lives of everyone in this province, whether it's your own fight or that of a friend or family member. Delivering better cancer care is a key focus of this year's budget. Work continues on BC's Cancer Action Plan with more cancer care teams, support for research, and help for patients who need to travel from rural communities. We're also making advances on screening with Canada's first province-wide lung screening program and at-home HPV test. These measures are already saving lives, as Christina from Port Alberni knows firsthand. She found precancerous cells through an at-home HPV test. After treatment, she's living cancer-free. Budget 2024 will commit an additional $270 million over three years to the fight against cancer. This will help strengthen prevention and screening services like the test Christina did and deliver treatment to people. Cancer care centres are also on the way for Surrey, Burnaby, Nanaimo and Kamloops. All of those will provide better care closer to home. We will continue working to fix the gaps in services and infrastructure left behind by previous governments. Because as BC's population grows and ages, we can't afford not to make those investments. Mr. Speaker, I think about the big family dinners at my house and the joy bringing a grandparent brings me. Everyone, everyone who wants to have a child Darn menopause, sorry. <laughs> God. Okay. I got it. Okay. Everyone who wants to have a child should have the opportunity to do so. However, infertility and other barriers can pose challenges. In vitro fertilization or IVF is one option, but it can be expensive. People who want to start a family should be able to, regardless of the relationship status, who they love, or how much money they make. <laughs> Starting on April 1st of next year, one cycle of IVF will be free in British Columbia. Budget 2024 commits $68 million over the fiscal plan to implement the, pa the program. I know this will be welcome news for many. Whether it's a person looking to have a child on their own, people who are experiencing infertility, or a same-sex couple who has tried other methods, this will help more people on the path to parenthood. This year's budget also includes significant support for education and services for young people. K-12 education is one of our government's top priorities, and that's reflected in this year's budget. We're responding to growing student enrollment with $968 million for more teachers and support staff in classrooms. We're also committing a historic $4.2 billion over the next three years to build, renovate, and seismically upgrade schools and playgrounds right across the province. That's more than double that was, than what was committed in 2017. To make sure children have, with learning needs have support to thrive at home and in the classroom, we are helping more families access services for individualized autism support. And to help children with learning differences like dyslexia, this year's budget commits $30 million over the next three years. New and expanded school outreach teams will help screen more than 150,000 students from kindergarten to grade three. Once the program is fully rolled out, we expect about 9,000 students per year will benefit from new literacy supports. Mr. Speaker, as a former early childhood educator, I understand how important reading skills are for a child's confidence and their success in life. With this year's budget, we are also improving frontline support for children and youth in care. This includes doubling the number of roots workers to help Indigenous children in care and out-of-care homes remain connected to their culture and community. Mr. Speaker, the world is moving to a clean energy future. With BC's strong economy, abundant natural resources, and skilled workforce, we have what it takes to succeed. And no matter where you call home, you should feel BC's economy working for you, with jobs and opportunities for you and your family to build a good life.
Budget 2024 commits more than $1.3 billion over four years to fight climate change and keep building a cleaner economy in partnership with First Nations, communities and businesses. Here in British Columbia, small business is big business. Small businesses create first jobs that turn into careers. They sponsor local sports teams and they employ more than a million people in this province. However, it's been a tough couple of years. Our government provided grants, not loans, to get them through the pandemic. But now small businesses are being squeezed by inflation and high interest rates. That's why our government is taking another step to help small and growing businesses with costs. Mr. Speaker, we are doubling the exemption threshold for the employer's health tax from $500,000 to a $1 million. Effective immediately, about 90% of businesses will be exempt from the tax. We've been hearing from business leaders that these savings will help to recruit and retain talent. To support these plans, Budget 2020, Budget 2024 continues to invest $228 million over three years in the Future Ready Action Plan. It's our government's plan to close the skills gap employers are facing and help people get the training they need to land a well-paying job. For example, we are creating 3,000 new tech seats at post-secondary institute in areas like data science, life science, and agrotech. In our province, we have a talented and growing workforce, along with an abundance of resources. There are natural strengths, and they are creating good jobs and opportunities around BC. In Maple Ridge, hundreds of people will be working at the new E1 Molly Battery Facility. <laughs> A capital investment of $36 billion in BC's electrical grid will generate work for over 10,000 people a year in the next decade. And a new mass timber facility in Williams Lake is just one of many new manufacturing projects that will offer good, secure jobs. Mining is another area of strength. We are a world-leading mining jurisdiction with the critical minerals to power a clean economy, from electric cars to wind turbines and solar panels. And we're ready to deliver with lower carbon emissions, good wages and working conditions, and in partnership with Indigenous peoples. Work is underway on a Made in BC critical mineral strategy. Today, we are committing $24 million to support further action on mine permitting in collaboration with First Nations, industry, and communities. Mr. Speaker, people understand that a growing clean economy is good for people and it's good for business. That's why Budget 2024 continues to support Clean BC, our continent-leading climate action plan, with $318 million over the next three years. We're making the cleaner choice, the more affordable choice. This year's budget will expand heat pump rebates for low- and middle-income households. New funding will grow the public EV charging network and help communities build more active transportation options like walking and biking paths. Additionally, we are continuing to fight climate change by putting a price on pollution. And when the price increases, every dollar of that increase will go back to the people through the Climate Action Tax Credit. Individuals will receive as much as $504 and a family of four up to over $1,000 through the tax credit. This will provide a meaningful boost for individuals, families, and seniors. Mr. Speaker, there are some who say the cost of action on climate change is too great. I'd say, look at the record wildfires, floods, and droughts we've experienced in the past few years. Think back to that night in November of 2021 when the Sumas River breached its banks. A local man named Chris and three of his friends grabbed their gear and got to work reinforcing the Barrowtown pump station. They were soon joined by neighbors from Chilliwack and Agassiz. When asked about that night, Chris said, I'm proud to say my neighbours, they fight. And there's no doubt, the fight against climate change will take all of us working together. This year's budget delivers $405 million over four years to better protect our communities from climate emergencies. We're upgrading key infrastructure like the Barrowtown Pump Station and the Cowichan Lake Weir. Built in the 1950s, the weir controls water flow into the Cowichan River. 
This has impacts on the local supply of drinking water and fish habitat, especially during drought. The regional district and Cowichan tribes have been calling for a rebuild and we're proud to support this important project and partnership. We are also committing more funding to the Agricultural Water Infrastructure Program. This will help farmers and communities better manage, collect and store water over the long term and during times of drought. There are many lessons to be learned from last year's devastating wildfire season. A key one being that emergency response is year-round work. When we're not fighting fires, we need to clear our forests of fuel. A total of $60 million in new funding for the Forest Enhancement Society of BC will help with that and more. <laughs> Additionally, we are providing more year-round wildfire response resources, including more fire crew leaders and frontline staff. More than 1,000 people have applied to the BC Wildfire Service as part of the latest recruitment. To those who are gearing up for the next wildfire fire season, perhaps for the first time, thank you. And thank you to the First Nations, local governments, and community leaders for your partnership. Mr. Speaker, our promise is stronger when there are good jobs, services, and opportunities to be found in rural British Columbia. This is reflected in our government's rural strategy with measures to deliver on the real ground results. We are building homes and hospitals all around BC. We are helping with costs when people need travel for cancer care. We are supporting Made in BC manufacturing to get more local jobs from every tree harvested. And we are connecting all residents to high-speed internet by 2027. The impact is big for people, businesses and communities. A study by BC Stats predicts a $432 million boost to GDP over 20 years because of our government's work to connect rural communities along the coast alone. Mr. Speaker, this year's budget will help keep people and goods moving through rural parts of our province. New funding will improve access to First Nations communities via forest and service roads, maintenance of critical roads and bridges, and support for inland ferry service. Passengers on BC Transit will notice more zero emission buses and benefit from, the, from 358,000 hours of expanded transit service in the coming years. We want rural communities to be places where people can live, work and put down roots, where the prosperity generated by local people and resources is reflected in the community, with the schools, hospitals and housing that all towns need to survive. That is why Budget 2024 will commit $250 million over five years to support the Northwest Resource Benefit Alliance. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, work is underway on projects funded through the Billion Dollar Growing Community Funds. Grants went to all 188 municipalities and regional districts to help respond to local needs, like building a new fire hall in Crofton, a new transit exchange to keep people moving in the Fraser Valley, and building more housing in the bulkley Nachaco region. We'll keep working with the Union of BC Municipalities and community leaders on infrastructure to support healthy villages towns and cities. Additionally, progress continues with the federal government on a national Indigenous loan guarantee program. We are establishing new provincial tools, including provincial equity loan guarantees, to support this ongoing work. If First Nations need to borrow funds to purchase an equity interest in a project, our government will provide guarantees to the lenders on those loans. We want to see this program grow over time to support the unique priorities of First Nations communities from major electrification projects to community greenhouses. Ultimately, this is one more way that our government is building a better, more equitable future. One where First Nations share the benefits of major projects that serve their communities in their territories and on their terms. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when faced with global challenges, there is a choice to be made. Some would choose to cut services and raise fees. But our government won't leave people behind to fend for themselves. We have your back. 
we have a $43 billion capital plan to build a stronger British Columbia over the next three years, when you can spend less time commuting and more time with your family, whether it's through the Fraser River Tunnel or the Patello Bridge, or along Highway 1 in the Fraser Valley, or from Kamloops to the Alberta border, or as a passenger on the Broadway subway and Surrey-Langley Skytrain, the first major transit expansion south of the Fraser River in over 30 years. We're building a stronger BC where you can get the health care you need close to home. New or upgraded hospitals are on the way for Surrey, Burnaby, the Cowichan Valley, Dawson Creek, Williams Lake, and more. I'm pleased to say that a brand new Mills Memorial Hospital and Terrace will be open to patients later this year. And we're building a stronger BC where you can get the skills to succeed in today's economy whether it's studying skilled trades at BCIT's Future Trades and Technology Campus or Early Childhood Education at North Island College's new centre opening next year. Together, we can get through today's challenges and build a brighter future, where you can afford a decent home and still get ahead, where your family can count on good schools and health care, where opportunities you only dreamed of are within reach for your children and grandchildren. These are the hopes that my family and I share around the dinner table and Budget 24 will help to bring this future in reach for everyone who calls BC home. And there you have it, an emotional BC Finance Minister, Katrina Conroy, delivering the 2024 budget from the legislature in Victoria. We're expecting BC United leader Kevin Falcon to respond to the budget in a moment. But first, Keith Baldry and Richard Zussman are at the Victoria Convention Centre with some analysis of what we have just heard. Gentlemen, as you predicted, this pre-election budget is anything but a belt-tightening one. Yeah, it's a big spender, Colleen. Thanks so much. And you heard the speech. Now you want to hear from Keith. So let's walk through some of the things we saw there. So we're going to see a record-breaking budget deficit here in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. The fact is Katrina Conroy laid it out. They don't want to see now as a time to cut spending. And that means we're going to run big deficits. What do you make of what we've seen in, in budget 2024? Yeah, no real surprise. On the news hour last night, I said a couple of key indicators to take a look at. Will the deficit be larger than the 3.5 or 3.7 billion dollars it was ex expected to be this year in the coming year it's almost well, it's more than double than what had been projected last year uh, will the debt be higher yes the debt is going to be higher than had been projected last year and so will the debt servicing charges so no surprise it's an election year we knew it was going to be a big deficit uh, we knew about the employer health tax uh, exemption I think you reported on that about uh, that being increased we knew there was going to be some sort of electricity rebate hundred dollars I think that's kind of underwhelming I think um, you know if you're gonna have a big deficit I thought the electricity rebate might have been a bit bigger than that. Uh, didn't see the in vitro uh, treatment, yeah. free in vitro uh, fertilization treatment, which I think is a significant for obviously many young families out there or people trying to have a family. So that, I think, is going to be get some very positive reaction. Uh, and the changes for the family bonus uh, for people. It's going to, it's now again, in allowing people earn up to $161,000 to uh, qualify for something like this. Which, again, this is a departure, significant departure from previous government financial aid packages where now people earning uh, high six-figure incomes are part of financial aid packages. We've never seen that before. So those programs are worth looking into. They are scaled. It's depending on how many kids you have, how many adults live in the household, but anyone below that 161 threshold should look into that program. It's an existing program, but the government is expanding the threshold. There's a few other things where they're doing that as well. One of the big ones here is around the property transfer tax exemptions. Mm -hmm. We knew they would be tinkering with housing and we also heard about the flip tax. We'll get to that in a sec. But for the property transfer taxes, they're changing that threshold. So it used to be if you were a first time home buyer, the home value you had to buy was $500,000 or less. You can't find a lot in this province for that. They have expanded that up to over $800,000 to $835,000 and you would be exempt from the property transfer tax up to that $500,000. So that's about an $8,000 savings for a first time home buyer there. The other things that we saw in here that are clearly important to uh, to dissect is around that affordability credit. You mentioned the flipping tax, which is 20% on the, the first profits of uh, the fr if you sell that house within a year of buying it and then there's a scale that goes down. With That's some something exemptions. we are expecting. So, you know, when you look at those sort of measures, is there a balance here to, you know, 
touch on all of the challenges, especially considering population growth that so many in this province are facing? Yeah, I still think the, the acknowledgement that people with, with relatively high incomes are now part of uh, government aid packages is a significant departure from anything we've seen before. And there was an acknowledgement by the minister in her Q&A that our continuing population, the pressures that come from our continuing population, particularly in healthcare, uh, healthcare is getting $4.2 billion yeah. more this year than last year. That was not anticipated in last year's budget. That, I think, is a reflection of the potential increased utilization of our healthcare system because our population is just so much bigger and it grows by about 200,000 people a year. And so a certain percentage of that will use the healthcare system. So I think that the, the evidence of the population growth and the pressure on, on, on the government uh, services, I think, is no more evident than in the health care budget that was presented today. A year ago, one of the big headlight grabbers was free contraceptives. Now, in vitro coming no. in in 2025. Colleen described it there, the emotion you saw on Finance Minister Katrina Conroy's face. She had that emotion at the same time when she was at this podium here speaking to us about it. This is something we've seen other provinces do. And I know from speaking to people who've worked for the Premier in the past, Premier Horgan wanted to do this. There were challenges with getting this program up. Premier David Eby has now come forward with it. It's obviously going to make a big difference for a lot yep. of British Columbians who are looking to add to their family. Oh, I think this is a political winner. I don't, I don't think there's any question. I don't think there's going to be any opposition to this. This is going to help a lot of people, young people trying to have families. Again, another measure aimed at young people. There is a, um, seems to be, again, a, a renewed focus or a new focus on uh, kids in school and young adults from this government in terms of helping them. We saw in the throne speech reference to banning protests at schools, for example. We've seen previous uh, measures announced by Attorney General Nikki Sharma and the Premier about sextortion situations, uh, explicit images on the internet of kids and such and now this is aimed squarely at, at young people trying to have a family and I think it, it's going to be very popular. One of the questions a lot of people have and I asked the finance minister this is what has been held back for the platform? And surprisingly she did not answer you. No but but you and I can guess yeah. right and and we know that in an election year we have an election coming up in October and this government's want, going to want to come to the province with a vision saying okay this is what we've accomplished since 2017 but this is why you need to keep us here. So looking aside from what we saw today, what is left to do here? Is it this rent-to-own program BC United brought forward? The government may put their own spin on it. What do you believe they've held back out of budget to say for British Columbians to say, what, this is what we're doing now, but look what we could do in the future? I think there's going to be more measures on housing. I think housing has been identified as the number one priority for everyone. It's driving all sorts of policies. Again, go back to David Eby's comments last week when he talked about housing, about people earning close to $200,000 in a family not being able to afford housing. So I think the election campaign is going to turn on a couple of new housing programs. I also think there's going to be, again, back to young people. I think there's going to be another type of initiative or, or push or policy aimed at young people, particularly young families. And I'm not sure exactly what form it's going to take, but I think that's the demographic that they're looking at. You know, the millennial uh, demographic is now the biggest demographic in BC. And the oldest millennials, believe it or not, are... I think 42 years old, so they're not university kids anymore. But these are people with, uh, trying to have young families, trying to buy a home. I think housing and young families are going to be the focus of a bunch of the NDP's campaign platform. So we hear every time in budget from a lot of stakeholders. Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze is one of them. He has long said that budgets have been built around mm -hmm. funding the older generations rather than all generations. He was glowing coming out he of was. the lockup today, in essence saying the government has finally acknowledged that we need to fund across generations and there's an equity in that funding like we've never seen. Whereas you see other organizations, the BC Business Council, Ken Peacock in essence said, now is not the time to be spending like this, adding to these deficits. We hear concerns from Bridget Anderson, who, who we'll speak to soon from the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, saying, yes, it's good that we got this boost on the employer's health tax, but there are still significant worries about where are we going to find jobs in future economy. We are seeing huge capital spending in this. Is that the solution? We're losing these private... Well sector jobs, the and you, uh, Canada and others, where's the solution? That was your question to the finance minister. He didn't really answer that. You know, we talked about once LNG Canada is over, Site C is yeah. over, where do these thousands of workers go? I think part of the answer lies in the housing initiatives. You, you and I have both reported on where are the workers going to come from? Who's going to build these houses? And I think that's an area where some, you're going to see a transfer of employment. And that's where, an area where I think you're going to see young people be employed at greater number. I talk, yeah, it's interesting to talk about Paul Kershaw. Yeah. We talked to him every budget. Every budget... He 
he's not happy because healthcare gets all the money, but he was happy today. Kevin Falcon is now out of the legislature in front of our cameras. Let's go to BC United leader Kevin Falcon. Full stop. Uh, I, it's frankly shocking. As recently as a few months ago, they were targeting a budget deficit of 3.75 billion, which was already a record. Today we find out it's almost an $8 billion deficit, the largest ever in the history of the province of British Columbia. You know, as recently as a few months ago, they had already doubled provincial debt to over $100 billion, and in this budget, it's going to increase by 64% over the next three years. And at the same time, and this is the worst part, it's not just the reckless spending, the biggest deficit ever, more than doubling the debt, it's the fact that we're getting the worst outcomes we've ever seen in healthcare, in public safety, in drug overdose death rates, in housing affordability, in every area that the provincial government's responsible for, we're seeing the worst results we've ever seen. And my friends, if that doesn't fill you with a lot of concern and dread, it certainly should. Final point I'll make is this. Once again, we're seeing them playing games with the budget. You recall this NDP government in the past has been accused of having fudged budgets. Note that what we're seeing here now is revenue optimism being injected into the budgets once again, where they're ignoring the Independent Forecast Council estimates of what the growth is likely going to be, and they're juicing that number to try and spike their revenues more. That's really problematic. It is very, very concerning to me. And uh, as I say, this is a, a reckless, inflationary budget that's going to make things more unaffordable for families. Because when government is spending this recklessly, it drives inflationary pressures which impacts groceries, it impacts housing, it impacts everything uh, that is already affecting British Columbians. And the final thing I'll say is this. The sad part about this budget, the really sad, tragic part about this budget, is that we're already seeing the results of what eight NDP budgets do to this economy and do to the public in this province. We are seeing young people in the prime of their working lives fleeing British Columbia for Alberta, for Ontario, for almost anywhere but British Columbia because they are tired of living in an NDP world where we've become the most unaffordable, expensive jurisdiction in the entire country. And I think that's very sad and tragic for families. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Kevin. We'll start things off with Rob Shaw. Check in with Rob. When the debt and deficit levels are raised in the finance minister, she says the province can afford it and is a position to afford you know, it, it, it frankly, it angers me to hear them be so reckless and foolish with taxpayer dollars. Because remember, we, a BC Liberal, now BC United Government, left them with a significant massive surplus, a AAA credit rating, um, you know, just an absolutely pristine situation where three of the largest capital projects in the history of this province were all simultaneously underway, projects which they opposed representing over $80 billion of combined capital in this province. They've frankly blown all that away and left us weaker. Uh, almost certainly we're going to see credit rating downgrades as a result of the total irresponsibility of this budget. And as I say, and the most upsetting part to me is the fact that they're doing it at the same time we're seeing the worst outcomes we've ever seen. Just yesterday we saw that once again British Columbia has the longest wait times of all walk-in health healthcare clinics in the country. So we get the most money being spent coupled with the worst results we've ever seen. I have said from the very beginning that it's, this government has never figured out it's not how much you're spending, it's what outcomes you're actually getting. You can spend a lot more money in government and continue to see worsening results, which is exactly what we're seeing on this eighth NDP budget. Um, and, and what you have to do is you need a government that has the discipline to be respectful of tax dollars, just like every other family across this province tightens its belt and does the right thing in the midst of difficult times. Everyone but apparently this provincial government, which is just recklessly spraying money everywhere, 
with the worst outcomes we've ever seen. And that is a policy recipe for credit downgrades and failure. And it just, it, it upsets me as a parent. I think that every parent and grandparent out there that worries about their kids and their future should know just how much more debt this government is passing along to the next generation with no good results to show for it. Well, it, it, again, it's so typical with the NDP. They're just, it's too little, too late. We've said that we would make that exemption a million dollars, which would save first-time buyers a further $10,000, just to put it in perspective. Those are the kind of decisions we need in this province now, to give genuine relief to people. That's why we said we would scrap provincial fuel taxes. That savings of 15 cents a litre for drivers out there makes a real difference every time they fill up their car. That's why we said no carbon tax on home heating fuels. They avoided that opportunity to provide some relief. You know, they've, they've more than doubled the carbon tax. They want to double it again at a time when people are really struggling. And uh, this budget fails to address the huge affordability challenge that British Columbians are facing right now. It's the most reckless budget spending I have ever seen coupled with the worst results that we've ever seen in this province. And that's what should give British Columbians uh, real pause. Uh, it, it is one thing for this government to brag how much money they're spending, but the problem is we've got the worst health care outcomes we've ever seen. Crime in our streets has never been worse. We've got the worst drug overdose crisis we've ever seen in the history of this province. We've got the highest fuel prices, housing prices and rents in the entire country. These are terrible results, frankly, and this budget will do nothing, nothing to make things better for average folks. Well, the one good thing I did see in this budget, and I think it's important to point out good things, is something that we actually called for two years ago and repeated that call again last year, and that was for funding of in vitro fertilization for young couples that are trying to uh, have children. Uh, now, sadly, there's no money in the budget this year to actually provide that relief. They're going to push it off until next year. And I want you to know when I become Premier of this province, we'll make sure that that gets done immediately because this is a huge issue for families. Families can't afford to wait for that opportunity. So while I congratulate them for moving it somewhat forward, I'm upset that they couldn't find $34 million in a health care budget of $32 billion to provide that, that support right now for families. Well, first of all, um, it's how we spend the dollars. It's not how much we're spending. Um, uh, you know, we've seen an explosion of bureaucracy in this government. We now have in the healthcare system 70 vice presidents all earning over a quarter million dollars a year for a population of five million people. That makes no sense to me, especially when in neighboring Alberta they've got seven. Um, you know, we have to run government the way families run their households. That means you have to be disciplined about how you're spending money and you make sure you're getting results for what you're spending. I don't know any families out there that just keep cranking up the credit card, spending recklessly without regards to whether the work's actually being done properly around their home or whatever they're spending it on. That doesn't happen in the real world. It only happens in NDP world. And uh, you know that, that gives me, uh, frankly, grave concern about the future of this province. Well, I'm not sure which tax cuts you're referring to. I know that uh, the complaint that I heard was that they're doubling uh, the employer health tax on the, those businesses that have payrolls of a million dollars or more. Um, that's not going to be a message that's going to be positively received. And remember, the business community has already had to weather a 20% corporate tax increase, uh, employer health tax, uh, five paid sick days, uh, new stat holidays. Uh, they've been hit with, uh, you know, tax increases and, and increased financial costs the entire time this government's been in power. Um, so I can pretty surely tell you that if you have a vote amongst the, uh, the small business community and the business community writ large in British Columbia about who they would rather have in government, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be the NDP. 
Falcons, the BC United leader, Bridget Anderson for the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade joins me now. I know you didn't hear all of that. I, I transcribed some of it for you to get a, a sense of it. But, you know, some of the things that he spoke about are concerns that you've raised. We're now going to run these record-breaking deficits. What is the sense you get from Budget 2024? I would say relief today, concern for tomorrow. And let me break that down. So our number one ask from the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade on behalf of the business community was to see some relief that businesses, particularly small and medium businesses, were needing. We know that there's about six and a half billion dollars in additional government imposed costs over the last couple of years for businesses. So our number one ask was to change the threshold on the EHT. The government did hear that. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that because that will be $100 million in savings, particularly important for small businesses. We also saw the electricity credit and that 4.6% relief will be important as well, a one-year relief for businesses. But we are concerned about the fiscal track the province is on with this increase that we're seeing in the debt and the deficit. You know, it is not sustainable. And so really needing to understand what the economic growth strategy is for the province when we have got three major projects completing and thousands of thousands of people looking for work coming out of that. One of the things we heard is this record-breaking capital spending. When I asked the minister about that, in essence, they believe they can fund projects to drive the economy, but there is this missing piece. With a growing population, do you believe the province is doing enough to incentivize private sector job growth in BC? No. And, you know, the, we are seeing unprecedented population growth. And so we need to see all kinds of investment in, in infrastructure, transportation, energy, but hospitals, schools, daycares, all kinds of things. Not just for where we're at now, but we need to see that for the future as well. Housing is another really important piece of that puzzle. But, you know, when we're talking about the kind of capital projects and we're talking about LNG Canada, we're talking about Site C, we're talking about TMX. These are enormous projects that are going to be completing. And so where are those tens of thousands of people going to go? And so that private sector investment is really, really, really important. And we are a high cost jurisdiction with some pretty significant regulatory challenges. So that was be one of the things that we were hoping to see in this budget and we didn't see that. One of the things the province is attempting to do is address those high costs. But as Kevin Falcon outlined, Line there, when you have high deficits, you have high debt, that impacts inflation, that impacts things like the cost of groceries and the cost of gas and the cost of living, and all that is this never-ending cycle. Where does the province need to look to, as big uh, uh, resource companies and others look to, for places to, to hire workers. What does the province need to do to incentivize to ensure that BC is the place that people choose? Well, for many, many years, British Columbia led the pack on economic growth. And if you look this year and next year, we're expected to be at the back of the pack in Canada. That is really concerning. So we need to create the environment so that the private sector wants to invest here. And that has been particularly challenging when we've got this high cost environment. So what is the kind of conditions that government can make that will attract investment? So it is things like uh, incentives, it's credits, it's things like that where companies who are looking to invest globally will see that British Columbia is the jurisdiction of choice. And that's one of the concerns that we're seeing in this budget, that we don't see that where we're seeing this increase in debt and deficit, but not necessarily the private sector strategy that needs to align with that. And you mentioned the employer health task ask was a big one, one that you've been calling for for a long time, but it didn't get to that 1.5 million threshold, and it still impacts those big employers in the province where they don't get any break from this, and they are going to help, in essence, fund everybody else. Are, are there more that can be done on that end, and are you worried about the competitive nature of the employer health tax and the impact it has? We were asking for an increase of the threshold to one and a half million, so we got part way there, and it is a hundred million dollars, which will really be a benefit to a number of businesses and particularly small businesses that are really struggling still post-pandemic trying to repay debts and get back on their feet but we didn't see what we wanted and entirely and there are other things that we've been advocating for on behalf of our members for a number of years now whether they're PST incentives or credits um, that would help with software or machinery those kinds of things that really fuel innovation you know the research that we did around the employer health tax shows that when you increase that threshold, that money goes directly back into wages, which fuels attraction and retention of talent, it fuels innovation, it fuels growth in the private sector. 
Are you worried at all, and this will be the last one, that there's a disconnect here, that the province is clearly speaking to a type of British Columbian and the business community gets left behind in some regards? I, I know you've had concerns of that in the past. There's an election coming up. People vote, businesses don't. But obviously people work for businesses. Is there a worry that, you know, that there's a push towards that voter that may be overlooking the impacts that it has on our business community here? Well, there's no question that affordability challenges have been felt by individuals and families for several years now. But businesses, which are the employers of these individuals and families, have been feeling the same kind of crunch. So the employer health tax was a really important measure. And again, acknowledging that they did, the government did listen to us and the business community called for this change, but does it go far enough? We would suggest that there is more work to do to ensure that we're creating the kind of economic conditions that can help businesses thrive, which will help communities and families and individuals thrive. Bridget, thanks so much for this. Thank you. Bridget Anderson is the president of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. We have lots more guests lined up here, but for now, we'll go back to you, Colleen. Thanks, Richard. If you're just joining us, it is B.C. Budget Day. B.C. Finance Minister Katrina Conroy rolling out her government's 2024 election year budget. The budget carries with it the highest deficit in B.C. history, forecast at $5.9 billion this year and climbing to nearly $8 billion next year. The government saying that deficit will allow them to not make any dramatic cuts to services despite wide-ranging economic challenges. BC is an economic leader in Canada, but too many people are still struggling to get ahead. Global inflation and high interest rates have made everything from housing to groceries more costly. And with a slower global economy, we are feeling the effects here in British Columbia. At the end of the day, people have a lot on their minds right now, and they're feeling stretched. In today's budget, the finance minister announcing more action aimed at stopping real estate speculation. In addition to the existing empty homes tax, the province is going after home flipping. To further crack down on speculators, Budget 2024 will bring in the new BC home flipping tax. To those who just want to make a quick buck by flipping homes, things are about to get more difficult. If a home is sold within two years of purchase, the profit will be taxed. And the revenue will go right back into building middle-class homes for people. All right, BC Green Party leader Sonia Furstenau is now reacting to today's budget announcement. Let's listen in. Going down on LNG exports at a time when we've had zombie fires in the, in the BC's northeast all winter long. Uh, they are not accounting for the enormous costs that we are going to continue to see as a result of impacts from climate change. And they are leaving the British Columbians behind who need government supports the very most. This is, a, this is a budget that fails to recognize that too many people in British Columbia just simply cannot make ends meet. And rather than recognizing that uh, we could make real headways with a wealth tax, with appropriately taxing the wealthiest people, we have the lowest tax rate for the wealthiest people in Canada, and instead this government fails to, the, to deliver the services that would make a substantive difference in people's lives, affordable, accessible, reliable public transit, a robust public education system, primary and public health care that people can depend on so they don't have to worry about what happens when they get sick, and climate action that moves our economy to a much more secure, much more stable future for our children and grandchildren. I think governments do need to invest in the future, but instead what we see from this, from this budget is a government that is spending an enormous amount of money without ensuring that those investments pay off for future generations. I'm concerned about the debt and deficit because they are not uh, coming from a place of real investments that would make a substantial difference for people in this province. Uh, we're not investing in the public services uh, and the public goods that could actually uh, move our province and our economy to the next generation. So 
we have a starved public education system, we have people who can't access post-secondary uh, education and training, can't lift up their skills. What we need is a government that creates the conditions for people to be able to thrive, to meet their highest potential, and instead, we have a government spending an enormous amount of money to basically keep things the same. Do you think they're holding anything back for the election based on the kind of sparse offerings that people have invited? Do you look at it and think it's not really what the NDP are going to present to voters uh, later this year? This was the BC NDP's government opportunity to show British Columbians that they have a vision for a future of this province that is not dragging us back to the 20th century. And yet again, year after year, this, this government puts out budgets that do not reflect the reality we are in and do not reflect the potential that we have as a province to be world leading when it comes to a clean energy economy, a sustainable economy, an economy that does not leave people behind, an economy that makes sure that people are parent paying their fair share, but also that there is a fairness for people at all levels of this economy. And this government over and over again demonstrates that it is uninterested in transformative change in this province. You had called for an increase in the threshold for people who could qualify for renters' uh, rebates. Um, what do you see in here for renters and the low economy housing? Uh, aside from what has already been announced by this government, there is nothing new here for renters. If uh, the Premier yesterday indicated that renters are struggling, if he wanted to make a substantive and immediate change, that would be vacancy control. In Victoria last year, we saw rents increase in between tenancies by over 40%. That is a problem that this government can solve and it's choosing not to. That would make a difference for renters. That would provide stability and security and freedom for people to be able to look at moving if they are not in, a, in housing that suits them. But right now, people don't have that. Okay, and can you expand on um, uh, BC failing on climate uh, measures? What is not what is missing? Uh -huh. I think the most important thing that people need to look at in this budget is the expectation on how much more uh, fracked gas we are going to be exporting from this province. I think it's also really important for people to connect the dots between being an exporting region of LNG and the implications that has for cost of living for people here in BC. In the US, the US Energy uh, Agency demonstrates over and over again in clear data that any region that exports LNG sees domestic energy prices go up. It is going to cost the people of British Columbia more for energy because of these LNG exports and meanwhile, this government is interested in lining the pockets of multinational oil and gas companies while British Columbians will have to pay more for energy. This is a terrible, a terrible direction for this government to take. And it's astonishing to me that after the hottest year on record in, in this world, we have three political parties who are denying the impacts, the costs, not only in money but in health, of climate change. It is, it is uh, truly an astonishing thing to see a budget from an NDP government in 2024 that essentially ignores climate change. You're going to hear a lot of that sort of messaging from Green Party leader Sonia first now between now and the election. Now let's focus in on teachers. Clint Johnston is the president of the BC Teachers Federation. Clint, uh, what did you make of the budget? Uh, well, for us, you know, our members will see what a lot of BC residents see, which is support for them in a difficult time. So that's really good. There's some positive pieces for the K to 12 ourselves. Um, a little bit of a disappointing budget, honestly. We've had some asks. We, there's a real crisis right now of uh, teacher shortage, and we were looking for some sort of plan and funding to address that in this. Um, but really, it's just a status quo budget that's going to address the growth over the next three years, but nothing else. 
What do we need to see when it comes to recruiting more teachers, to retaining them, to supporting them better in the classroom? What do you want to see from the province? Well, there's a lot of pieces. We need to develop more teachers uh, here. And one of those pieces is reaching out to some rural and remote areas to make that more accessible so people don't have to leave their communities to get that. Um, you know, you need some sort of incentive for people to go to those rural and remote communities and spend some time there. So uh, incentives uh, like loan forgiveness, some sort of comprehensive loan forgiveness program would be great. Um, and we also need to fully fund, you look at inclusive education, which is, supports our most vulnerable students, and it's perpetually underfunded, about $350 million a year roughly. Um, so we need those kind of things to make sure that we can work here, students learn here. We're seeing unprecedented population growth in this province. That is putting pressure on our teachers, on our schools. We are seeing in some communities overcrowded classrooms. No announcement here in terms of new schools. No announcement, as you described, in terms of getting more teachers in to support those new students. How worried are you about, you know, the lack of investment in new schools, but also, you know, addressing that overwhelming population growth we're feeling in BC. Yeah, that's a very good point. We're pretty worried about that. Um, it'd be great to see more of an announcement now. You know, it is an election year, so I expect we might see some school announcements roll out over the next few months. Um, but just as important, as you say, is who's going to be in those schools, both student-wise and uh, who's going to be in there to support them through that education. So we'd like to see those facilities being built for sure to relieve that pressure. Um, but it's important to take those other steps so there's people in there supporting students to get the education they deserve. You talk about support. Uh, you recently put out an open letter around the fact we are seeing in some cases EAs and other support workers being filled in for teachers because those positions aren't filled. I think there was some expectation we may hear some of that from the finance minister. We didn't. Mm -hmm. Like what else can be done and, and, and how challenge, what are you hearing from teachers out there about their ability to support students in our system? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty grim in some cases. We did a survey last year of our membership and a very high percentage of them said that they've been affected by this shortage and the, the main way that they were affected is by being unable to offer the supports to students that they should have been able to. Um, and that's really devastating for people who get into this profession to make sure that children can get the education they deserve. We see those specialists who support often our most vulnerable learners being pulled to put in front of classrooms like you said and that means those learners don't get that support during the day and it's a stress on that teacher and on the teacher when they're thinking about, can I go away? Or is one of my colleagues going to have to give up their day? Last one for you. And you mentioned we're in that election year and you do expect we're yeah. going to see some announcements around schools, maybe in some swing ridings. You know, that's the sort of thing we see during elections. But what else, if you were to be able to get in front of the government and say, or all the parties, when you prepare your platforms, what would be a good selling feature for teachers in this province when these uh, parties are building their platforms? Uh, well, I think it's what we've done and what our members came to Victoria to say with us uh, late in the fall, which is that education is a fundamental cornerstone. Uh, it's underfunded. It's got some real gaps right now. Um, and if we want to do things like eradicate poverty, if we want to make sure that the workforce is ready to fill those gaps you're identifying in other areas, we need education to be fully funded. We need to make sure we have enough teachers and the students get the supports they deserve. Clint, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. All right, Colleen, again, lots of guests lined up here, but we'll go back to you for now. All right. Thanks, Richard. You're watching live coverage of B.C. Budget 2024. B.C. Finance Minister Katrina Conroy has rolled out her government's election year budget. It carries with it the highest deficit in B.C. history, forecast at $5.9 billion this year and climbing to nearly $8 billion next year. The government says that deficit will allow them to not make any dramatic cuts to services despite wide-ranging economic challenges. BC is an economic leader in Canada, but too many people are still struggling to get ahead. Global inflation and high interest rates have made everything from housing to groceries more costly. And with a slower global economy, we are feeling the effects here in British Columbia. At the end of the day, people have a lot on their minds right now, and they're feeling stretched. The budget is also promising a small rebate on the cost of electricity for families and businesses. A new BC Electricity Affordability Credit will save seniors, families and individuals an average of $100 on their household bills over the next year. And the average small businesses will save around $400 over the year. The credits will appear on bills from, March to next April, from April to next March. And the province is also increasing the size of the Family Benefit Program. Many families will already be familiar with the BC Family Benefit. And now, starting in July, more parents will receive more money as we launch bonus payments for one year. The BC Family Benefit Bonus will add 25% to the benefit and go to about 340,000 families.
With the year-long bonus, a family of four will receive as much as $3,563. $500,000 to $835,000. Budget 2024 will build more housing and help first-time home buyers break into the market. Because even with a good job and, st and steady saving, it's tough to put together a down payment these days. As a result, there's more pressure on the housing market with people renting for longer. But as most people will tell you, every little bit helps. The first time home buyer, home, the first time home buyer program was designed to provide that financial boost. But the program no longer reflects the realities of today's housing market. That changes with budget 2024. First time home buyers will save up to $8,000 thanks to a reduced bill for property transfer tax. We expect up to 14,500 people, twice as many as before, will now be eligible for support to buy their first home. It's too little, too late. We've said that we would make that exemption a million dollars, which would save first time buyers a further $10,000, just to put it in perspective. Those are the kind of decisions we need in this province now to give genuine relief to people. BC United leader Kevin Falcon responding angrily to the government's budget, saying the province's biggest ever deficit isn't producing results and calling it irresponsible and reckless. This is the worst example of reckless spending that I have ever seen in a government budget, full stop. Uh, I, it's frankly shocking. As recently as a few months ago, they were targeting a budget deficit of 3.75 billion, which was already a record. Today we find out it's almost an $8 billion deficit, the largest ever in the history of the province of British Columbia. You know, as recently as a few months ago, they had already doubled provincial debt to over $100 billion, and in this budget, it's gonna increase by 64% over the next three years. And at the same time, and this is the worst part, it's not just the reckless spending, the biggest deficit ever, more than doubling the debt, it's the fact that we're getting the worst outcomes we've ever seen in healthcare, in public safety, in drug overdose death rates, in housing affordability, in every area that the provincial government's responsible for, we're seeing the worst results we've ever seen. All right, we are handing it back to Richard Zussman, who is at the Victoria Convention Centre. Richard. Thanks, Colleen. Raji Mangat is with me now from West Coast Leaf. Uh, what is your sense of what we saw in the budget today? Um, you know, I think we're very happy to see that there is, it's not a, a deficit budget. It's not a budget, or sorry, a budget where there's austerity measures. Um, it feels quite a bit like a maintenance budget. There's some really good news stories in there. Um, but, you know, given the fact that we know population growth is, is quite, quite a big jump that was identified last year, um, it'll be interesting to see how the services that are being maintained at these levels will actually um, impact the population growth we know we have and will continue to have into the future. Now, let's get into that a little bit because I know you want to talk about some of the other measures in here but let's yeah. talk about that population growth. 250,000 people added to this province in the last two years. You mentioned service delivery is built around assumptions and as those assumptions are thrown out the window so what are you going to be watching closely for in terms of where we may be lacking some of those services to deal with this growing population? Yeah so I mean I think there's a lot of things that we could be looking at. Um, I noted with interest that the minister talked about, you know, not wanting to have deficit services. Um, but I feel like without attention to that population growth and without attending to that, we will end up in three years with just that. Uh, so we're going to have to keep an eye on um, things like the healthcare services that are being provided, things like the um, child care and where that's going, um, as well as some of the investments being made around um, mental health supports and supports for addictions. Like we know we're in a drug toxicity crisis here. Um, you know, we're, we're operating under that maintenance assumption, um, which, you know, as you said, is not really going to be a viable assumption. We have to, we have to build in growth. So we need, we need growth economy in terms of services as well. Yeah. And I think the devastating thing for so many is we've seen that growth. We continue yeah. to see record-breaking numbers of people die. We are seeing more people who need services, and that's not just mental health no. services. It's services across the board, and as you have more people moving to this country, there may be a requirement for a new type of services in various languages. Like, 
does the government need to have a more holistic view on this to address you know, some of these challenges they may not anticipate coming? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think one of the things that we didn't see in the budget that I was disappointed not to see was sort of some integration across some of the, the, the sort of bigger action plans that we know the government has, um, has in play. Like we know they have released a provincial gender-based violence action plan. We don't really see a lot of reference to that or like there's some hints here here and there, but it doesn't feel like it's very well integrated. Um, that equity analysis doesn't feel like it's super well integrated into this budget. Um, so there, you know, there are going to be these pieces um, around what kind of services we're going to need. We're collecting data on like racial disaggregation. How is that information going to inform service delivery and what programs and policies are developed? And we don't really get a sense of that very much in this budget. One of the things I think surprised some people in this budget, finally, after mm -hmm. many years of asking, the province is bringing in supports for in vitro fertilization. It's mm -hmm. something that we'd heard Premier Horgan speak about. Yeah. Uh, Premier Eby is now bringing it in through this budget. How impactful will this be for families who are hoping uh, to add to their family, but have hit some financial challenges uh, doing so, who, who need to go the route of IVF? Yeah, no, this, this was a surprise, happy announcement. Um, I think, you know, IVF in this province can cost anywhere between sort of 12 to 16, up to $20,000. And this will provide um, one round of IVF for anyone who's in need of that service. And it brings us in line with other provinces across Canada where that is a, a core part of healthcare. So seeing reproductive health um, identified here as a priority is really exciting. Um, I think, you know, we will want to see what more there is to come. I was very appreciative of the recognition and the language around that announcement. It was, it was very clearly not sort of only specifically for um, women or cis women. It was, it was much more open language. And I think in the context of what we're seeing happening in other provinces, um, it's nice for BC to show that leadership um, and, and have this, um, this, you know, very concrete tangible thing that will make a big impact for people who want to grow their families and don't necessarily have a traditional um, family structure or a traditional um, a approach to how that's possible for them. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we obviously have lots more coming from here in Lockup. And plus, Colleen, I promise we'll eventually get Keith Baldry's review of the food here in Lockup, but that's going to come a little bit later on. I'm not sure we're ready for that. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, the uh, leader of the BC Conservative Party is now speaking. Let's go to that live. BC is an economic leader in Canada, but too many people are still struggling to get ahead. Global inflation and high interest rates have made everything from housing to groceries more costly. And with a slower global economy, we are feeling the effects here in British Columbia. At the end of the day, people have a lot on their minds right now, and they're feeling stretched. The uh, B.C. Conservative Party leaders' comments now. Over $44,000 for a family of four in terms of debt and added debt. And what we're seeing as well is a, is a budget that is missing several very, very critical things. We're seeing, I think, a $600, billion, or $600 million shortfall in transit in the lower mainland. There wasn't any mention of that being resolved. We've got a $500 million for BC ferries that's running out, that is going to need to be made up. Where is that in the budget? What is that going to mean for costs in the future? We are seeing Site C that is going to be coming on stream that's going to have significant increases to BC hydro rates. We're not seeing that reflected in this budget. We're also seeing the end of construction of LNG Canada, of the coastal gas link, of Trans Mountain, as well as Site C. That is going to have a significant downward pressure on British Columbia's GDP. That does not reflect it in this budget. Matter of fact, they're going even ahead of the forecast allowance. What we're seeing, quite frankly, in this budget is uh, what I think is a completely unrealistic picture designed simply to try to get votes. And I think, quite frankly, the voters of British Columbia should see it for what it really is, which is not putting people first, which is not putting our future first, and is not doing anything to be able to address the affordability of groceries or housing or rent it's creating those crises are there, and we're just seeing more of the same from this government. 
anything in the budget that you like? There was a couple things I did like in the budget, yes. I was happy about seeing the $250 million, uh, over five years uh, for the Northwest. Obviously, uh, that's an important piece of infrastructure that needs to be done. Uh, the IV, the IVF, uh, I was very pleased at as, as well to see that as part of the budget. I think that's an important piece of being able to support families and, and particular you know, people that would like to be able to start families. What about the minister who said she had a choice to make cuts or, or spend and they decided to spend? Well, so since this government has taken power, uh, what we have seen uh, is a massive increase. Even before this budget, it was a 40% increase in spending per person in this province. And yet you're seeing a crisis in health care, you're seeing a crisis in housing, you're seeing a crisis in affordability, you're seeing a crisis in crime, you're seeing a crisis um, in, in the addictions. The forest sector is in a crisis. Resource sectors are struggling, looking at going elsewhere. So when you look at them and say they are worried about doing cuts, I would suggest that they are a government, quite frankly, that hasn't got their priorities right. With all that additional spending, how is it that we have all these crises? Obviously, the money is not going to where it needs to be going to be able to actually help people in this province. Uh, actually, talk about the forestry sector a little bit. Uh, what did you see in the budget uh, that should give rural British Columbia pause, or that should also perhaps uh, give rural British Columbia some some promise? I, I talked to Michael Berry from the Mining Association, and he seemed to be relatively pleased with the, uh, with the budget. And mining obviously is something that happens in rural British Columbia. So, if, can, can you talk sure. about that aspect a little bit? Um, I think the, uh, there's a little bit of money that's going towards permitting, but quite frankly, that whole process needs to be completely reviewed and changed. It is uh, overburdensome. Uh, we are the highest cost jurisdiction in North America when it comes to forestry. Forest companies are struggling just to be able to make ends meet, uh, even with prices in the, in the mid 500s or even higher uh, for, for lumber. That is not how you be able to build a future. So many communities around this province depend on that. In the mining industry, we have 14 mines in British Columbia that are ready to go. That would add $38 billion of investment to this province. It would bring $800 billion over the life of the mine in terms of GDP. It could create between 200 and 300,000 jobs. Did we see that in the budget talked about? No. We talked about you know, more plans, more structure around you know, a, a, a process, not actually getting to the work of getting these things off the ground and going and driving that investment into British Columbia. I'll bet I catch you afterwards on that. Just in case, so the other people don't have to hear the repeat. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, the Land Act. Um, yes. We didn't get your comments yesterday on the Land Act. Uh, what do you think of um, government's decision? Uh, I think, quite frankly, that it's, uh, it's reflected of a secret agenda. Um, they aren't being upfront with people in this province. If you're going to be making changes to going towards, um, going towards uh, joint decision making, and they say it's shared decision making, we've had shared decision making for, for more than a decade in British Columbia, and we do that, did that under my government, uh, the government I was part of, uh, doing it under the current government. What they're talking about doing is going to joint decision making. Decision making in British Columbia needs to be done by the government of British Columbia for all of British Columbians. It should not have a veto for groups, one group or another, First Nations or another. We need to be able to deal with issues local to First Nations, but there should not be a veto from First Nations. They're talking about having more consultation with people, and I think that's good. Obviously, we're seeing some input around that. Uh, but I can tell you, more consultation to this government means they're just kicking it down the road before they implement it. That has been their pattern with everything else they've done in this government. Um, and I think I'm, I'm very concerned about that, quite frankly, that, some, that should the NDP have the, uh, have the fortune of forming another government, that they'll just implement that without the public's consent to be able to do it. We have now heard from all the major party leaders, John Rustad, obviously the Conservative Party of BC leader. Let's continue some analysis. Historically, we've seen some NDP budgets with big spending for child care. Sharon Gregson is an advocate for $10 a day child care. But today felt a little bit different, Sharon. Give me a sense of what you made of the budget, especially when it comes to the province supporting its child care program. 
Well, we heard the minister say how important childcare is and her personal commitment to it, but we really didn't see that reflected in provincial spending, sustaining um, what has been existing spending. Any new dollars are coming from the federal government, and even that's not huge. So it's, um, it's surprising that they aren't putting more dollars into 10-a-day childcare expansion. Yeah, Ottawa is what I want to ask about, because we know the federal government has gotten on board with this, but in essence, has the province said, okay, this is not our responsibility anymore, let's let Ottawa pay for it. Are you worried about getting to that goal that every family in this province will have access to $10 a day childcare? Yeah, so a little worried, a little surprised that it isn't a bigger profile at this point. When you look at the BC budget now for childcare, more than half of the spending is from the federal government. We always knew there was a role for the feds, but we didn't expect the province to step back. And so we are going to be looking for the province to really ramp up because we know 75% of kids in BC don't have access to a licensed childcare space. Of the childcare we do have, only 10% is a 10 a day site. And that's what people want. It's life changing for families. And so we'll be pushing them. And what do we need to do to get to a point where there are more spots offered? Is it just money or is there more that needs to be done in terms of training, in terms of facilities? What else needs to be a priority here from the government to ensure that people have access to this program that they've been promised? Childcare is a three-legged stool. So we have to have the spaces, which takes public planning and expansion, particularly with school districts. We need investment in early childhood educators because there's no sense having childcare if you don't have anybody to work in those programs. And then the childcare we build needs to operate at 10 a day, which means adequate funding for the operators. So the government has to move on all three fronts to make this successful. We know we have an election coming up in the fall. I think one of the defining moments of the 2017 election was that commitment from then NDP leader, then Premier John Horgan around getting to $10 a day. As we look forward now, seven years later, what would you say to the party leaders when they build their platforms around making those commitments to families that are counting so heavily on ensuring good, safe, reliable childcare in this province. You're right. People voted in 2017 for 10 a day childcare. They voted again for it in 2020. Now they want to see it delivered. The expectation of families in this province is that they should be able to access quality licensed childcare at $10 a day or no more than 10 a day. And that people working in the sector should be fairly paid and well qualified. That's what the general public is waiting for. And last one for you, Sharon. One of the challenges as well, just finding people to work in the sector. You talked about training, but still, it is challenging work for people to do. You know, those who take care of their kids wonder, you know, how do other people take care of my kids? It's hard enough to take care of one, let alone a room full of them. So what can we do to, to help incentivize and motivate people to come into the sector? And is that working with um, bringing in more people? From We know that people are coming here to BC from all over the world. Is it about placing them in places where they can, you know, uh, help fill some of the shortages we're experiencing? We want people who are passionate about children to be working in early childhood education. Five other provinces and territories have implemented province-wide wage grids for their educators. We know that's a solution here. We need a fair province-wide wage grid as part of good overall compensation. It's incredibly doable um, and it's what the public wants. It's what we voted for. It's, it's time for it to be delivered. Sharon, thanks so much thanks. for doing this. All right, Colleen, back to you. Richard. BC Green leader Sonia Furstenau says the budget doesn't go far enough in helping those most in need. And she says the government needs to do more to prepare for changing climate. At a time when we actually needed to see some bold moves from this government, we get instead an astonishing $89 billion budget that keeps us in the status quo in this province. Uh, this government has seemingly abandoned climate leadership uh, and when you look at the budget you can see that they are doubling down on LNG exports at a time when we've had zombie fires in the in the BC's northeast all winter long uh, they are not accounting for the enormous costs that we are going to continue to see as a result of impacts from climate change and they are leaving the British Columbians behind who need government supports the very most. The head of the BC Teachers Federation says while this budget will allow for the education system to continue along the status quo, there isn't enough money to improve classroom education. The union's president says they were hoping for more. 
pieces. For the K-12 to ourselves, um, a little bit of a disappointing budget, honestly. We've had some asks. We, there's a real crisis right now of uh, teacher shortage, and we were looking for some sort of plan and funding to address that in this. Um, but really, it's just a status quo budget that's going to address the growth over the next three years, but nothing else. All right, we are heading back to the Victoria Convention Centre and Keith Baldry and Richard Zussman. Gentlemen. Thanks, Colleen. You can only really judge the quality of its budget based on its food. <laughs> so we'll get to the serious stuff in a moment. But before then, you, you commented okay. yesterday <laughs> on BC One about how bad the food was. I don't think it's bad. What was the sense you got about actually having your lunch here at Budget Lockout? I'll give him a V. The okay. sandwich wasn't bad, okay? I'll, I'll give him that. But you, you got a, a brownie. A for brownie? I didn't get the brownie. You got the brownie. So what can I say? At one point, it looked like we weren't getting any food because it was an hour earlier than usual in terms of departure. And reporters were going, where's the food? And suddenly they brought out some, some sandwiches. And as you say, you got the brownies. I didn't get the brownies. It's important context to know that Keith and I have been locked in this room since 8 o'clock this morning. We haven't been outside. We haven't had out. fresh air in six hours now. So... The fact we're talking giddy. about food, yeah, a little bit excited to get to the fresh air, but let's talk about the serious stuff. Um, we've heard now from the party leaders, you know, it's what we expected to hear from them in terms of concerns. As you sort of walk through the thoughts of the budget, I know one of the things you've looked at today is the debt. Mm -hmm. We know there's big deficits that leads to debt, that leads to costs. Are you worried about the ramifications of debt based on what the province is doing here? Look, that was my questions for the finance minister in the Q&A. Are you concerned about debt? We're going to hit about $165 billion in the fiscal plan by the end of the fiscal plan. Uh, we're, last year we were at $103 billion. So you see how fast that escalating. And it's not escalating so much because of deficits. Even though we're going to run deficits of seven, six, five billion dollars a year, it's this huge capital spending that is underway. It includes BC Hydro's massive spending to electrify the province, but also continuous spending on hospitals, schools, roads, highways. It's at very expensive projects and it's adding up. I don't think the general public sees this as a huge issue yet. Yeah. I think they'd rather see a hospital built or a school built knowing it's adding to the debt. The deficits, again, I don't think it's a, it's a big public issue. I think people, are, the NDP's read of the room is that people want more from government, not less. And then, Jen, I'm talking to Sharon Gregson, who you just had on, just off camera before she came on, about, and it was your question about, to Conroy, who of course you didn't answer, what are you holding back? And I get the, and again, talking to Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze, who's just sitting back there, um, He's detecting, and we talked about this before, there seems to be this shift in the NDP philosophy to help young families yeah. and younger people. And I think maybe that's what was being held back in today's budget. Things like more childcare and more things for the millennial population, which is the biggest segment of the population. And maybe that's what we're going to see just before the campaign in, in October. You talk about deficits and and pressure and the greatest pressure we're feeling in bc right now is this population growth mm -hmm. Two hundred fifty thousand people in the last two years and a number of the guests that we've spoken to over the last hour have said in essence the same things this is great big spending but you're in essence maintaining a lot of programs just to keep up with that population and the fact is as we deal with the population coming in and getting into the workforce and all of those challenges, how worried should this province be about the sustained pressure of population growth and what that means to the services? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've done stories on this, so have you, about the, the huge pressure population puts on our, our society, healthcare in particular, but also education, schools. You had Clint Johnston on who basically says this is funding existing enrollment and projected increase in enrollment, but the fact that more and more kids are going to be coming into the school system and more schools have to be built. There was no mention of a Surrey school today, for example, yeah. in the budget. And we've all talked about double-decker uh, portables. There was one new school in the budget. That was a school here in, in Victoria, middle school. Um, so yeah, the pressure's on to build more hospital beds because of uh, 350,000 people who joined the medical services plan in the last two years. A percentage of those will need to use the hospital uh, system. You know, it used to be the norm. We'd have about 9,400 people in a hospital bed. Now over 10,000 is routine. And that's an increase in just a few months. And that's going to continue to go up and up and up. We, we know we're seeing these capital costs, and this will be the last one, but these big projects are going way over budget. They are. And as we put more projects on, how worried should British Columbians be about just the fact the province is struggling to manage these projects because of the cost of labor, the cost of supplies, but is that going to be a long-term problem with this huge investment in capital projects that we can't even so keep them close to budget? I talked to someone in, in transportation about this a few months ago, and he says that the, the horizontal projects 
the, the subway line, the, the, tran the sky train line, those are not going over budget. It's the vertical projects. I didn't know there was a different type of construction. Yeah. Those are the hospitals that are going over budget, the schools that are going over budget. I'm not sure why that is or if there's different construction techniques or something, but it's fascinating to see. I checked the capital budget today again. The subway line is on budget. The, uh, the SkyTrain is on budget. There's no number change in the Massey Tunnel uh, replacement project, yeah. but the hospital budgets are up significantly. I think about half a dozen of them are significantly over budget, and that's because of a shortage of, of materials and resources and, and staff shortages, which can lead to some of the... We've got those two projects at the B.C. Legislature, <laughs> those two fire escapes that have been taking two years <laughs> yeah. to build, because and you're wondering, why is it taking so long? And, and the veteran... Uh, Guy, some of the veteran guys who work on the, the, the ancient walls of the legislature are scratching their heads. Why is it taking these outside crews so long to build what should be a pretty simple project of a, some stairs going up a building? And, Two years it's been taken. And Colleen, those are projects of made appearances on BC1 through their noise in the middle of Keith or my life. Yeah. So our, our viewers will be familiar with those projects of the legislature. Right outside our window. <laughs> because they're happening right outside our window, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, now we know for sure. Gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> Richard Sussman and Keith Baldry in Victoria after a long day of budget analysis that began early this morning. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage of Budget 2024. We, of course, will have more coverage here on BC One and, of course, coming up on Global News at 5 and the News Hour at 6. Stay with us.